Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org. The following material is copyrighted and may not be duplicated, reproduced, or redistributed without prior written consent from the Veritas Forum. Join us as we explore true life. Thank you very much, and thank you for the welcome to the university, to the city, and to this extraordinary room. I always feel bad when there are people hanging around at the back, and I hope you will be able to get uh, seated, at least some of you. And those of you who even have little children, I see. Um, my goodness, that's, that's remarkable. They start them young here. Um, <laughs> I, I've been asked to speak about this uh, recently published book, Simply Christian, and uh, that's always slightly an odd thing to do because I'm tempted to read you bits of it, and indeed I shall read one or two little bits just to give you a taster of what it's about. Um, I've got a copy of the English edition here, which doesn't look at all like the American edition. Has anyone got a copy of the American edition they could wave so that you can actually see what it looks like, so that when you then see it on the bookstall, you, there it is, you will all rush off and buy it at once. Thank, that's what I'm supposed to say. I've got a, I'm working to a, a script here that HarperCollins have given me, but, but thank you very much. And this, this was a fun book to write um, because my brief for it was the rather scary one of trying to do a mere Christianity for the 21st century. Many of you will know C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and indeed it's one of the books that I grew up with myself. Um, in, the, in the 60s when I first started reading Christian literature. And uh, this book isn't really a bit like that, with one exception which I'll highlight as we go along. But what I've tried to do in the same tone of voice, as it were, as Lewis, is to say this isn't about how to be an Anglican, which I happen to be, or a Catholic or a Presbyterian or anything else. It isn't about how to be a special variety of Christian. It's about what I see as the very central heart of the Christian faith. And so, no surprises, of course, the book is quite a bit about Jesus, and quite a bit about God, and quite a bit about what that all means for us. But let me talk you through how it's going on. And to set it in context right now, we are in my country, and you are in your country, in the midst of quite a turbulent time in terms of the whole question of religion, faith and public life, integrating what you believe with who you are and what you do, we have in my country at the moment several controversies, rather hot issues running in terms of how we do this religion and public life thing. We have uh, issues about Muslims in our society, whether Muslim women should have the right to wear the veil if they want and to keep it on at all times. Some of our politicians have been saying that women who teach in schools should remove the veil in order to do so, and some Muslims are up in arms about that. And this has backfired into the Christian community in that there are people who have uh, either been threatened with losing their jobs or have actually lost their jobs for wearing a cross, which is more usually worn, I think, by women than men in my culture. I happen as a bishop to wear one as part of my official, official costume, as you see. But the idea that in the UK, in my lifetime, somebody would be threatened with dismissal from a, a job, in one case with British Airways, another case with the BBC, for wearing a cross in public, I find quite extraordinary. I mean, even though I find it shocking, I, am, I find it more just a remarkable social phenomenon. That's where we've got. People are so uptight about Christianity and uh, about how it relates to the world and about religion in general and how it relates to the world. My view is that we get into trouble about that sort of issue because neither our politicians nor our media, by and large, have taken the trouble to study and understand what actually Christians believe and how that might relate to the public world. And though this book wasn't written to answer that question exactly, I do believe that what I'm trying to say in this book and in some of my other writings about Christi the Christian faith and its true nature should not only shake up some, um, I fear, rather second-rate ways of thinking about the Christian faith, but actually address some of those larger public issues, which are of really quite urgent importance in our world right now. 
So how are we going to talk about God and Christ and the world in ways that make any sense at all within the larger social and cultural community where we are placed? Some people start by simply going straight for the question of Jesus, who he was, what he did, what it all meant. That's fine. That's one perfectly good way in. If you start off with that, you shouldn't go too far wrong, although there are, of course, voices in our culture that will push you or pull you this way and that in your interpretation of Jesus. But I wanted to start in a more oblique way and try and reach out to people who might be coming from a long way outside the Christian faith and might actually start to think, why should I even even care whether this man Jesus even existed. What, what's, what's going on that might draw me in? At this point, some Christians, some philosophers, have tried to start off by proving, quote unquote proving, the existence of God. I'm not sure that you can actually do that in any way that makes sense to people today or in any other day, because to prove something, you have to accept some sort of framework of reference and then prove what you're proving in relation to that framework of reference. And then the framework of reference becomes the really important thing, and the thing you're proving is merely one function which it happens to have. So if somebody says to me, can you prove that God exists, what they normally mean is, granted that I am a late Western human being or perhaps a postmodern person or whatever, can you show me evidence for God within the framework of thought that I am assuming to be absolute? And my answer to that is if God is God, if there is a God, and if this God is worth talking about with that word God, then this God must be greater than all our frames of reference. So to seek to put this God into such a frame of reference really isn't going to do the business at all. So I start off rather differently. The first section of this book, it's got three sections this book, I actually intended there to be a fourth section, and when I was nearly finished the third section, I told my publisher how long the book had got and what I wanted to do in the fourth section, and he said, no, no, it's quite long enough already, please don't go any further, just finish that last chapter and we'll, we'll go with what you've got. He was also frightened that if I said there's going to be a fourth section, I might take another few months and we were right up to the wire with the deadline, but that was another story. I'll talk about what might go in the fourth section uh, a, a little later, or if I don't, remind me when we come to the Q&A. But I, I started this first sec in the first section with what I call echoes of a voice. Echoes of a voice. We've got lots of potential voices outside there. Um, there is still some more sitting room if people want to come up at the front. Um, but the image that I'm using is of somebody who's in a room and can't see anybody outside, but hears a voice. And it seems to be saying something sensible. And they can't be sure who it is or quite all of the conversation, but they're aware that there's something happening there. And I track four voices of which I believe all human beings, to a lesser or greater extent, catch echoes from time to time. And the first of these, and this is where I pay homage to C.S. Lewis, because this is where he started in his book, Mere Christianity. The first of these is justice. To put it crudely, we all know that the world needs putting to rights, but we are all puzzled because we don't seem to be able to do it. And this applies both globally to politicians who see the great things that are wrong with the world and say, right, we're going to sort that out. And then at the end of their lives, they say, well, we have this program and that agenda and we passed these laws, but there still seem to be a lot of problems out there which we haven't sorted. And it applies also to us as individuals, that we know there are many things that are wrong in our own lives. And I don't just mean wrong in the sense of, oh, there I go again, I keep on doing something that I know I shouldn't. There are things which are kind of out of joint and need putting to rights about ourselves and the way our world is. And that's remarkably hard to do, and yet we know it ought to be done. You don't have to teach people that, that uh, there is such a thing as justice. You go to a playground where there are kids aged five playing together, and this is Lewis's point, pretty soon one says to another, that's not fair. How do they know that's not fair? It's not because they've been to a seminar on the nature of justice. It's because we come hardwired with a sense of fairness and unfairness, of justice and injustice. And the puzzle about it then is that we know there is such a thing as putting things to rights and we don't seem to be able to do it. And that constitutes one of these strange voices of which we all catch the echo. And I say all. Christians, Jews, Muslims, people of any faith and none, secularists, modern people, postmodern people, we all know there's something called justice. The second echo of a voice that I talk about in this first section is spirituality. 
30 years ago, if you'd put on a lecture called Spirituality in the Modern World or something, probably no one would have shown up because everybody knew that spirituality was what we got rid of with the brave new world of secularism in the 60s and 70s. Well, spirituality is back with a bang. And whether or not people want orthodox Christianity, they certainly want to reflect the fact that as human beings we are multi-layered, many-dimensioned creatures and that there is far more to life in the world and as a human being than you can put in a test tube or indeed in a bank balance. But what is this spirituality? How can we tap into what seems to be out there? That's one of the images that people use. And spirituality is puzzling because some people spend their lives pursuing one spiritual path only to find that it doesn't seem to satisfy them. It doesn't scratch where they're really itching. And the call to explore other dimensions to human life, which is, again, I think, common to most human beings in most societies at most periods of history, that too leaves us often puzzled, hearing the echo of a voice but not being quite sure where it might be leading us. And the third of these echoes that I track here is the question of relationships. Again, to put it crudely, we all know we are made for one another, but we all run into difficulties in making that work. And this works, again, at every level, from the global, where we know in our bones that we ought to be able to work together as a global family. It's crazy, all this business of, of wars and rumors of wars and cutting economic deals which cut out a third of the human race, or even worse, from any, pro any prospect of prosperity. We know that we ought to be in better relationships with each other. And yet, however hard we work at it, it's jolly difficult. And likewise, at the most personal and detailed level, friendships are hard to sustain often, and the most intimate, even familial, even marital relations can be very difficult to work at, even though we say to ourselves when we get up, I'm really going to get this right today, we can still blow it. And so relationships, like justice, like spirituality, are enormously important, and yet we find we're getting them wrong. And the fourth of these is beauty. Uh, I invented a little parable to describe what I think is going on with beauty. And I just want to read you a little bit of this. Uh, I'll summarize a bit and then kick into the text a paragraph or two in. I want you to imagine that one day somebody in an attic in Vienna is grubbing through some old papers and they come upon a music manuscript, a piece of scrawled writing. It looks as if it's meant for the piano. Somebody tries it out. Strange, don't recognize this. The handwriting, wait a minute. This looks like Mozart's own handwriting. This is very exciting. Take it to the piano, play it through, and it really sounds like Mozart too, and it's a piece that we didn't know before. That's wonderful, but what is it? And then the puzzle continues because there seem to be bits missing where the piano seems to be silent for a while, and then it kicks in again doing something else. And it has wonderful bits that are building up to a climax, but we don't seem to have all of it. And then the truth dawns. This is the piano part for a larger piece of writing, for maybe a string quartet with a piano accompaniment, so a string quintet, or maybe it's a violin sonata and we've only got the piano part, or something. It's beautiful, but it's haunting because it's pointing beyond itself to something else. And so I say, this is the position we're in when we're confronted by beauty. The world is full of beauty, but the beauty is incomplete. Our puzzles about what beauty is, what it means, and what, if anything, it's there for, are the inevitable result of looking at one part of a larger whole. Incidentally, I wrote that little opening section to this chapter uh, just a couple of months before a librarian in Philadelphia came upon a Beethoven manuscript which turned out to be Beethoven's own transcription of his Grosse Fuga for two pianos. Wonderful case of life imitating art as it seemed at the time. <laughs> but the point is that beauty, like justice, slips through our fingers. We admire the wonderful sunset and then it's dark. We admire the fantastic beautiful flowers and then they fade. We wonder at the beauty of the face of a child or even the beauty uh, through age of a wise old person. But we know that all that beauty is going to fade and that ultimately there is this thing called death 
which, though our culture has tried to pretend it isn't terribly important, we all know perfectly well that it is hugely important and that it's one of the problems with all of those four things, justice, spirituality, relationships, and beauty. So there are puzzles, both about how we can get at them and what they are, and yet those echoes are persistent. And instead of saying, as one might at this point in the argument, well, here are the echoes of a voice, and these echoes prove that there is a voice and that it's the voice of God, I say, no, I'm not trying to go that route. I'm merely saying, as you hold those echoes in your mind and reflect on them and what they mean, try listening to some stories, stories about people who have spoken, stories about a God who has spoken. And because this is a book about Christianity rather than some other stories that you might listen to, I say try listening to the story about Jesus. And so the central section of this book, which I've called Staring at the Sun, is about trying to talk wisely about God and about Jesus within the context of God and about the Spirit of God as the spirit of Jesus let loose into the world. And it's staring at the sun because, again, if God is God, we shouldn't, be a we shouldn't expect to be able simply to tell the exact truth about God so that there are lots of questions people can say to us, is God like this, is God like that, to which the answer of a genuine believer might be, I really don't know and I don't think we can know. I'm not claiming that I can give you an exact account of God any more than when I stare at the sun, not that I do because it's bad for your eyes. You can actually see it very clearly. It's blinding and dazzling, and God is a bit like that. And if God is God, that's what we ought to expect. But at this point, we run into problems because of the way the word God functions within our culture. If you walk out onto the campus here and say to somebody, do you believe in God? The proper answer ought to be, um, which God are we talking about? I think actually today people are more aware than they were um, when I was, I was going to say your age, the age of most of you here, um, that God is not, the word God is not univocal. When I was growing up it was assumed that we all knew who God was if there was a God and the question was did you believe or not in that God. And the God that that referred to again and again was what I would call probably a deist God. Deism has a distant, remote, detached deity, rather some, some way away from us, who may well have made the world in the first place and may well from time to time look down with a bit of a frown to see what we're getting up to and what sort of a mess we're making of this world. But probably this God doesn't get involved too much in the world except occasionally to punish bad people and eventually to take good people away to be with him forever in a place called heaven. That's what many people think you're talking about when you're talking about when you use the word God. Equally, in our day and in some other generations, not least in the first century AD, there has been the opposite version of the opposite view of God, which is the pantheist option that God and the world, instead of being miles apart from one another, are pretty much the same thing, or at least that God is the soul of the world or the life of the world, so that there is divinity anywhere, in anything in you, in me, in the trees, in the flowers, everywhere. Everything is divine or part of the divine, or the divine is in and through everything, just permeating it. That's actually quite a difficult position to maintain once you're faced with radical evil in the world, because if something really, really bad happens, but if everything is divine, where are you going to appeal to? And that quickly leads to cynicism, and in the ancient world, frequently, pantheists such as the Stoics, when bad things happened, well, the option was suicide. And actually, as pantheism has been on the rise in our culture, so the rise of suicide has often gone along with that. Not necessarily cause and effect, but it's an interesting phenomenon. But those two equal and opposite ways of looking at God and the world, in the book I do it the other way around and I call pantheism option one and deism option two, those two options are not the classic Jewish and Christian option of how to talk wisely about God. Within Judaism, the God who made the world is both other than the world and present in and with the world. The latter being very mysterious because the world is in quite a mess and yet God has not withdrawn the divine presence from it. 
So there's a paradox within Judaism which comes out in institutions like the temple. The temple for the Jews wasn't simply a big church building on the corner of one street in Jerusalem. The temple was the place on terra firma where the living God had promised to live. So that you've got a God who is transcendent, who is other than the world, and yet has said that he's going to live with and among his people within the world. And that's a paradox which neither option one nor option two can really cope with. And it gets developed in Judaism in a wide variety of ways. God's wisdom, which is his gift to humankind so that we can be wise with God's own wisdom. God's word, which is breathed out, a word is a, is a, is a vocalized breath, as a result of which things happen in the world. So that when God speaks, his word actually goes out and does things in the world. These and others are ways of talking about a God who is other than the world and yet present and active within the world. But if God is present and active within the world, then what's it like being God but being present and active within the world, the way it is? And the answer is it's a matter of grief as well as joy, of sorrow and tragedy as well as comedy and delight. And so in the story of Israel, and I devote an entire chapter to the story of Israel, because if you don't do that, you won't actually understand who Jesus was and what it was all about, being Jesus and why he came. I devote a chapter to Israel in which I talk about this people who were called to be God's people for the world. Not God's people away from the world, but God's people for the world, to be God's light into the world. And yet they too found that deeply puzzling because they kept on trying to do it and kept on getting it wrong. And yet the word kept coming to them and through them that if they stuck in, if they held at it, the God who had made the world and who had called them would eventually figure it out and make it all come together. And in the story of Israel, we find again and again those four elements that we heard as echoes of a voice. The passion for justice. The Jewish people had that ingrained in them over and over again. The need for justice globally and communally. The sense of spirituality, because that's what you get if you believe that the living God is somehow present with you, gives you that extra dimension to your life. The sense of relationships, because the Jewish law is largely all about how you relate to one another and how you can relate wisely and actually make it happen, even though they kept on getting it wrong as well. And again and again, growing up within the life of Israel, you get this sense of transcendent beauty, nevertheless being glimpsed on earth. The temple itself being a good example. The temple in Jerusalem, one of the joys of the whole earth, the way it was built. But then particularly in the prophetic literature, those amazing pictures of an ultimate beauty, of a world put to rights, filled with joy as well as justice, where the wolf and the lamb lie down together with a little child leading them. An amazing, haunting, beautiful image carrying forward. And you can feel people saying, oh, I wish... Oh, if only. And then, of course, as the climax of the story of Israel, and that's how the uh, New Testament writers see it, we get the arrival on stage of Jesus of Nazareth himself. And I'm going to read you just a little bit um, at the beginning of chapter 7, Jesus, the coming of God's kingdom. Christianity is about something that happened, something that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, something that happened through Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, Christianity is not about a new moral teaching, as though we were morally clueless and in need of some fresh or clearer guidelines. Not to say Jesus didn't give a lot of moral teaching, he did. But that's not what it's basically about. Christianity is not about Jesus offering a wonderful moral example, as though our principal need was to see what a life of utter devotion and loyalty to God and goodness to one's fellow human beings was like and could copy it. Actually, if you had something like that, it could be rather depre depressing. I'm a very bad golfer. I enjoy playing golf, but I'm very bad at it. So I, I, people ask me, why as a bishop you play golf? I say it's important to have something in your life that you can do really badly and enjoy it, and it doesn't matter. Just about, <laughs> just about everything else I do, I'm supposed to get moderately right. But if I, watch, if I watch Tiger Woods hitting a golf ball, that doesn't make me feel, wow, that's great, I can go out and do it. I think, oh, well, that's it. I'll never be able to do that. And when I read the stories about Jesus, I sometimes feel that. In other words, yes, he is a great example, but
but it's actually not always terribly encouraging to those of us who find that our moral lives uh, seem to be much more fragmented than that. Nor, this is enormously important and quite controversial, nor is Christianity about Jesus offering or demonstrating or even accomplishing a new route by which people can go to heaven when they die. It's a medieval notion that the name of the game of Christianity was to escape this world and go to a place called heaven. Within the New Testament, again and again, and I'll come back to this, so please get your heads around it, within the New Testament, again and again, the final destination of God's people is God's new heavens and new earth. Read it in Revelation 21. Look at it in Romans 8. See it in the way that the gospel writers tell the stories of the resurrection. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven, not in heaven as in heaven. And that wasn't a temporary prayer which we could then give up praying once we died ourselves. The New Testament envisages the coming together in renewal of God's whole creation. Ephesians, 1, chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, God's purpose was to sum up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. And so I say to you, as I've said again and again in lectures in various contexts over the last year or two, heaven is important, but it's not the end of the world. Yes, when you die, if you belong... Yeah, somebody gets it. When you, <laughs> when you die, if you belong to God's people, Paul says you go to be with Christ, which is far better. But there is a greater future out beyond. Now, I'll come back to that. I just jumped ahead on that. Um, but the point of Jesus' coming was not to show us how to escape earth and go to heaven. The point of Jesus' coming was to say, kingdom of God, here, now, get on board. We in the church have often falsified that. Likewise, Christianity is not about giving the world fresh teaching about God himself, as though the main thing we needed was more information about what God is like and who he is and what he's up to. So what is Christianity all about then? Christianity is all about the belief that the living God, in fulfillment of his promises and as the climax of the story of Israel, has done what we needed, finding us, saving us, giving us new life in Jesus. With Jesus, a great door has swung open in the cosmos which can never again be shut. It's the door to the prison where we have been chained up. We are offered freedom, freedom to experience God's rescue for ourselves, to go through the open door and explore the new world to which we now have access, and to discover through following Jesus that this new world is indeed a place of justice and spirituality and relationships and beauty, and that we are not only to enjoy it as such, but to bring it gloriously to birth on earth as in heaven. And in Jesus, we discover whose voice it is that has echoed around the hearts and minds of the human race all along. But it isn't, of course, just a matter of Jesus coming and saying, OK, kingdom here now, that's all right, isn't it? Because it isn't. Because the world is a dark place and a tragic place and has been for a very, very long time. And woven into the fabric of the Israel story and then reaching its climax in the Jesus story. And by the way, I've got another, I've got another recent book out called Evil and the Justice of God in which I address this whole problem of evil and what God does about it much more centrally than, and in detail than I was able to do in this book. Uh, right at the center of the gospel story, we find that the evil of the whole world, the evil of power structures, the evil which is what we call natural evil, evil within people. To the central figure, to the Jesus who ends up hanging on a Roman cross. And so... And again, let me just read you a little bit. The meaning of the story is found in every detail as well as in the broad narrative. The pain and tears of all the years were met together on Calvary. The sorrow of heaven joined with the anguish of earth. The forgiving love stored up in God's future was poured out into the present. The voices that echo in a million human hearts, crying for justice, longing for spirituality, eager for relationship, yearning for beauty, drew themselves together into a final scream of desolation. 
the death of Jesus of Nazareth as the king of the Jews, the bearer of Israel's destiny, the fulfillment of God's promises to his people of old, is either the most stupid, senseless waste and misunderstanding the world has ever seen, or it is the fulcrum around which world history turns, and Christianity is based on the belief that it was and is the latter. But of course it didn't end there, and I and others have explored at length the question of what precisely happened on the third day after Jesus' death. And I've argued elsewhere substantially for understanding the bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, not only as a real event within real space-time human history, but as the launch pad for something which many Christians have just not got on board with at all. If you go into church on Easter Day and listen to sermons on the resurrection, again and again you'll hear preachers saying things like, Jesus died, therefore there really is a life after death. Jesus died, therefore we can be assured that we will go to heaven. Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus rose again so, so that we can be assured that we will go to heaven. Jesus rose again so we can have a new life here and now. And all of those have truth in them, but it's not what Matthew, Mark, Luke and John say. They say... Jesus has been raised from the dead, therefore God's new creation has begun and we have got a job to do. That's rather different from some of the escapism which you often get in Easter preaching. The resurrection is not about proving that there's a life after death. First century Jews mostly believed that anyway, with some exceptions. The resurrection is the launching of God's new creation. And in fact, the resurrection of Jesus is not so much a very, very odd event within the old world. It is the prototypical and launchpad event within God's new world. Believing in the resurrection, from the New Testament's point of view, is believing that. It's about the new thing that God is doing, in which God will not rest until, as the prophets foretold, the earth not just heaven, but the earth shall be full of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the promise. And we who live between Easter and the fulfillment of that promise are not to be passive spectators. We are not merely to be beneficiaries of God's new world, though, please God, we will be that, but we are to be agents of it. And that's what gives genuine biblical Christianity its central dynamic. How can that come about? Well, of course, the New Testament says it comes about because God breathes his own life into those who follow Jesus in a new way so that they become, often to their surprise, able to be new creation people. And that is the foundation of it all. And I have two chapters on the work of the Holy Spirit in this book, rounding off the Staring at the Sun central section of the book, in order to show how it is that as we breathe in the life of God, so we are not only little by little, and often painfully slow, transformed in ourselves, but more to the point, able to be transforming people in God's world. Because that transformation is the point at which those echoes of a voice have to be translated into a voice which we ourselves utter and a voice which we ourselves do something about as we become people who can work for justice, who can uh, develop and explore the riches of spirituality which are ours as fully human beings, who can work at relationships, ours and those around the world, and who can be agents of transforming beauty beauty which will lure people to glimpse the glory of God, even in many unlikely places. So our task is to discover through Jesus whose voice it is that we've been listening to and see what it would mean to follow that voice and become part of the project which that voice has in mind. And so the third and final section of the book is called Reflecting the Image. Because the task of being a Christian is the task of being a genuine human being. A lot of people get this mistaken idea that to be a Christian, you're going to be somehow a shrunken sort of human being, a sub or semi-human being, rather than a fully alive, glorious creature reflecting the image of God. And sadly, the church has often given quite a bit of credence to that, as many Christians have thought it was their job to live rather shrunken human lives. Not so. Yes, of course, there is renunciation in the Christian life. There is fasting. There is taking up the cross. But ultimately, the aim is 
to become more truly human. And that begins with worship and prayer. So I have a chapter on each of those at the beginning of the third and last section of the book. Worship for many Christians is, well, of course I'm a Christian, of course I believe in Jesus, of course I read the Bible, uh, and of course I try and live a Christian life. Oh, and of course I go to church on Sunday and sing a few hymns. But actually, worship is the very center of it all. I was about to say the dead center of it all, but it's entirely the wrong metaphor. Worship is, the, <laughs> worship, is the, worship is designed to be the living center of it all. Because one of the great spiritual laws is that you become like what you worship. And if you are made in the image of God, of the, the God who made the whole world, then worshiping this God is the way to reflect God into the world. Notice how the image of God language works. It isn't just that being image bearers means we are rather like God in some way or other. Theologians have often explored that. The idea of the image is that of an angled mirror reflecting what's up there to what's out there and back again. When I lived in Oxford, we lived just down the road from one of the great classical museums in Britain, the Ashmolean Museum. And I remember walking down a long gallery one day looking at all the statues of Roman emperors. I was trained as a Roman historian before I became a theologian, so I'm kind of interested in first century history. And I looked uh, it just struck me as I was going down where all these statues came from. Uh, great big statues of emperors and their children and their wives and their families. Not one of those statues, as far as I recall, came from Rome itself. Those images were all from places like Egypt and Turkey and Spain and France and anywhere else around the Mediterranean world except in Rome. Because in Rome, they had the emperor and his family. They knew what they looked like. But the rest of the empire needed to have images of the emperor to tell the subject peoples who their lord and master was. And the point about being made in the image of God is that God has put into his world a creature, namely ourselves, human beings, whose purpose is to let the world know who its creator is. And we do that by the wise stewardship of creation, and we, in the same time, reflect the praises of creation back to God, the creator. Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is all about that. And thus we become genuinely image-bearing human beings. And within that, I have various discussions about sacraments and other aspects of Christian worship, which fit remarkably well once you understand how creation and new creation are designed to work together. That all inevitably leads to the question of what about the Bible itself? And uh, you have battles for the Bible in this country um, much more than we do in my country. People aren't nearly as interested in the Bible in the UK. I wish they were, actually. But often in, when I come to America and lecture about the Bible, I find there are huge controversies about what actually to say about the Bible, which is a shame because the Bible itself, simply diving in and starting to read it, is so absolutely stunning that it's much better just to let yourself get soaked in the story than to worry about particular theories. The theories matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as reading the text. I'm going to read you another little bit from the beginning of the first of two chapters on the Bible. Um, my, my, my parents are getting on now, and my father, who's in his mid-80s, reads everything I write. Bless him, he, never, he was a businessman. He never read any theology until I started to write books. And in his old age, he's really got quite interested in it. But um, I visited them some weeks after I'd sent them a copy of this book. And he said, you need to know that my copy of this book now falls open at page 148, as it is in, in the English edition. I said, why is that? He said, because everyone who comes to the house, I read them this opening paragraph. So I'll read it to you. It's a big book full of big stories with big characters. They have big ideas, not least about themselves, and make big mistakes. It's about God and greed and grace, about life, lust, laughter and loneliness. It's about birth, beginnings and betrayal, about siblings, squabbles and sex, about power and prayer and prison and passion. And that's only Genesis. <laughs> in other words, go for it. This is, you know, I sometimes, sometimes after morning prayer with my chaplain in the little chapel we have at home, um, we, we've read a chapter from Kings or from Jeremiah or whatever it is, and I come out and I say, you know, supposing that book had been lost forever, and then somebody had dug that stuff up in the sands of Egypt and had published it, we would all say, this is the most amazing stuff. 
you know, I, I, I read ancient literature till it's coming out of my ears because I was, as I say, as a classicist by training. And this is just an amazing book, this Bible. We Christians don't actually take it nearly seriously enough. But how do we take it seriously? Well, I talk about that quite a bit. But the point is this, that scripture is not designed to be authoritative in the sense of having a textbook on the shelf so that you can go and look up the right answer to your questions. There are lots of right answers to lots of questions, but that's not how the authority of scripture works. According to the Bible itself, God is the one with authority. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus doesn't say, all authority in heaven and earth is given to the books you chaps are going to go and write. <laughs> Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. So if you take the phrase authority of scripture, which I do, I take it very, very seriously, that must actually be a scrunched down shorthand way of saying the authority which God has given to Jesus somehow mediated through scripture. But as soon as we say it like that, and that is how the Bible comes to life when we take it like that, then we say, but what is God up to in the world through Jesus? And the answer is, God is dealing with sin through the cross of Christ and is launching his new creation through the resurrection of Christ and is applying that to human hearts and lives and to the whole wide world in the power of his spirit. And then the question is, I mustn't pick up my own book as if it was the Bible, but supposing I've got a Bible in my case. So when we have the Bible in our hands, supposing I do for a moment, we are having it there, not so that we can be safe, sound, good little Christians, but so that we can be energized agents for God's mission in the world. That's what the authority of scripture looks like in practice, ought to look like in practice. And so, and I've explored that a lot more both in this book and, and elsewhere. I'm nearly done, bear with me. So I then have um, a chapter on the church and again, for a lot of Christians today, not least young Christians, the church is, face it, a bit, a bit of a turn-off. And it's remarkable, really, that you've shown up to see a bishop in all his regalia and so on, because for a lot of people today, that stuff is just yesterday's story, and we want to do it differently today. I fully understand that. It's not actually so very long ago that I was young myself, but I've got um, children and now grandchildren who keep me very young, and I know that the church often presents as a very dull, very boring, very out-of-date, dreary, muddled, misguided sort of place. And yet, and yet... One of the great reformers, John Calvin, said, if God is our father, the church is our mother. Because when you become a Christian, you become a member of the family. It isn't just that if you believe personally in Jesus, then it might help to go to church from time to time because there may be some people there who can help you on your way. It is that we belong to one another and that that belonging actually matters enormously in terms of what God intends to do in and through the church for the world. And we can't do that by ourselves. We can't do it as isolated denominations. We need one another. Church unity matters, even though it's hugely difficult and actually hugely stressful very often. And believe me, because I, I try to work at that. But then in the last chapter, and the last chapter got longer and longer once my publisher told me that this had to be the last chapter, so I was <laughs> shoving more and more into it as I was, as I was finishing writing the book. But it's, it's about new creation starting now and about the challenge which we have ever since the resurrection of Jesus to say God has launched this project of new creation. It's about justice and spirituality and relationships and beauty and a whole lot more besides. And what are we doing about it? And it's about announcing to the world that there is a God and he is its good creator. It's about announcing to the world that Jesus is the Lord of the world and so Caesar isn't. Caesar in the ancient world and whoever Caesar might be in the modern. It's announcing to the world that God's spirit, who is the spirit of truth, is let loose into the world and that all our fumblings and mumblings about truth, not least within post-modernity, have to be rethought and reassessed in the light of that. But what's that going to look like? How do we actually go about that? What is the way, the early Christians called Christianity, the way? It's a way that we have to go. It's because we are called to become, in the power of the Spirit, 
people through whom new creation can happen, starting here and now. New creation deep down within people's hearts, new creation as wide as the world, where two-thirds of the world is in debt today, hopeless, unpayable debt, to one-third of the world. And the one-third is us, you and me. It's about working for new creation in places where global warming and other devastating things are happening to the environment. Some Christians have a real difficulty about that because I suspect the agenda of new creation has somehow slid out of the back of their Bibles and got forgotten in the frantic quest for them simply to be rescued from the world and to go off to heaven forever and ever, amen. It's not what you find in the New Testament, as I said. Heaven is important, but God's eventual goal is new heavens and new earth, and we are to become citizens of that and agents of it in the present time. And so Christian ethics takes its place. Think back to what I said about uh, the different views of God, and actually I ran that all through the book, but I just haven't footnoted it for you, to, for you this evening. A lot of people think of Christian ethics in terms of that deist view, that there's a God upstairs somewhere who's made a list of rather difficult and arbitrary rules, and he inflicts them on us poor humans and gets very cross if we disobey them. It reminds me of, again, another first century Roman story. One of the Roman emperors who was particularly malicious, who used to delight in inventing uh, odd laws at a moment's notice and having them carved very, in very small letters on stone tablets and then stuck up high on buildings so that people could hardly read them so that they would break these laws and then he would have an excuse to punish anybody he wanted for doing so. A lot of people really do conceive of Christian ethics along that sort of model. Equally and oppositely, some people have thought of Christian ethics much more in terms of getting in touch with the way the world is, getting in touch with, with and being true to my deepest feelings. The Romantic movement and existentialism have driven us quite a long way down that road, as though because the world is God's world, whatever we find in it is really good and to be affirmed, so we've just got to go with that and find the way through somehow. Neither of those corresponds to the God we know in Jesus and by the Spirit. Neither of them actually constitutes Christian ethics as such. Christian ethics comes when we take seriously the goodness of the God-given world, but also the radicalness of the evil which has infected the world, and also the dealing with evil that happens through Jesus and the Spirit and the birth of new creation. In other words, when we map what it means to be human on the story that I've been trying to tell, albeit very briefly this evening, then we discover that, yes, of course there are rules, but it's not just a matter of learning the rules and trying to do them. It's a matter of those being the key guidelines which remind us what it means to be people of creation and new creation, people of the cross and the spirit, people who know, therefore, that they're going to have to say no to some things which feel deeply ingrained in their person and in their world, and also to say yes to some things which seemed, at least to begin with, completely counterintuitive. It's not easy. It takes wrestling and wisdom and struggle and not least fellowship with other people who are on the same path. But as we do so, we discover again and again and this is obviously the theme, the underlying theme of the book, that those four echoes of a voice become more and more true to who we are and what we're trying to do. If you deafen your ears to the call of justice anywhere in the world, watch out, think whose voice it is you're squelching. If you fail to pay attention to the spirituality which is there in and through the whole of God's world, if you think it's only what happens when you kneel down and say your prayers, Watch out, because you are belittling a key element. If you play fast and loose with relationships at any level, individual, communal, global, watch out. We are made for one another to reflect God's image together. And if you scorn or spurn the call of beauty, as though it's irrelevant, just a bit of pretty stuff around the edge, but we're going to get on with the reality in the middle. Beware, this is God's lovely world. We have only heard the piano part of the music. One day, we're going to hear the full quintet. So let me read you the final paragraph of the book. Made for spirituality, we wallow in introspection. Made for joy, we settle for pleasure. Made for justice, we clamor for vengeance. Made for relationship, we insist on our own way. 
made for beauty, we are satisfied with sentiment. But new creation has already begun. The sun has begun to rise. Christians are called to leave behind in the tomb of Jesus Christ all that belongs to the brokenness and incompleteness of the present world. It is time in the power of the Spirit to take up our proper role, our fully human role, as agents and heralds and stewards of the new day that is dawning. That, quite simply, is what it means to be Christian, to follow Jesus Christ into the new world, God's new world, which he has thrown open before us. Thank you very much. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org.